I'll be hitting cleanup. I'm Eric Mazur. I'm the Gloria and, Fer Gloria and David Furman Professor of Judaic Studies and Professor of Religious Studies at Virginia Wesleyan University. Uh, I'm the author, editor, co-editor of a variety of things, including God and the Details uh, with Kate McCarthy, uh, the Encyclopedia of Re Religion and Film, the Routledge Companion to Religion and Popular Culture with John Lydon, the Bloomsbury Reader in the Study of Religion and Pop Culture with Lyle Dalton and Chip Callahan, and as it turns out, I'm a contributor to and one of the co-editors of Religion in Outer Space, which is due to be published sometime this summer. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to have Sarah come up. Her paper is titled The Wrong Way Home, St. Elon's Digital Cult of Personality, Messianic Meditations of Mars, and the Musketeer Meme Militia. Good morning, everyone. Ooh, I guess I speak a little bit louder, <laughs> sorry. Um, so today I am giving a little sneak preview of my chapter. The title of the chapter, the first title of the chapter, The Wrong Way Home, is drawn from psychiatrist uh, Arthur Dykeman. Oops, that was my original slide, sorry. Um, of the three Elon Musketeers. Uh, but my title, The Wrong Way Home, is drawn from psychiatrist Arthur Dykeman's work. Uh, Dykeman, over decades, conducted research into the dynamics of authority, the human desire for safety, security, and belonging across multiple sectors and socialities, both conventionally regarded as being religious and uh, those mostly considered to be conventionally secular. Uh, Dykeman begins The Wrong Way Home with an exchange between between two characters you probably recognize from Char Charles Schultz's popular Peanuts comic strip. Peppermint Patty asks Charlie Brown what he thinks security is. Charlie Brown in turn defines security by recalling a resonant image from childhood. Quote, when you're a little kid and you've been somewhere with your mom and dad and it's night and you're riding home in the car, you can sleep in the back seat. You don't have to worry about anything. Your mom and dad are in the front seat and they'll do all the worrying. They'll take care of everything. Dykeman explores this pattern of human longing for safe passageway home, not simply in self-identified religious groups, but across a variety of political movements, corporate settings, educational contexts, and other social milieus. Dykeman's caveat, of course, is that in assuming that cozy position in the back seat of the car, allowing others to drive, curling up and drifting off to sleep with their cozy pillow in back, one risks being taken the wrong way home. In examining troubling aspects of Mars colonization, marketing, and space expansionist capitalism as promoted by SpaceX founder and billionaire CEO Elon Musk, Dykeman's cautionary tale of being led the wrong way home soberly resonates. Elsewhere, I have analyzed the potency of New Earth verbal and visual prophetic rhetorics uh, strategically deployed in SpaceX marketing to promote Mars colonization. Both SpaceX's promotional mes messaging and Musk's own public statements effectively tap into not only culturally embedded resonant religious imagery of a promised new heaven and new earth, but evoke popular notions of rapturing up an elect population to an otherworldly true home, while also reinforcing the ideal of a godly ordained manifest destiny to conquer new frontiers. I've also argued that as Musk successfully rebrands Mars as Earth 2.0, the strategic use of apocalyptic Mars as New Earth rhetoric activates troubling dynamics that effectively legitimize siphoning off Earth's fragile resources in order to feed the colonial and corporate interests of a technocratic billionaire elite. In turn, I've called for more effective and a greater number of public media interventions that gang we can engage in too here, into Musk's ap apocalyptic messaging that counter the narrative that humans must urgently move to Mars or face extinction. But 
in this presentation, I turn specifically toward examining the role played by Musk's zealous digital fandoms in promoting Musk as an all-knowing, salvific, super genius, while helping him to sell his utopian fantasy of saving the human species from an apocalyptic earth by bringing us to our new salvific home, Mars. Mars fans have been, dis uh, sorry, Musk's fans have been described as an army of loyal followers who stand by the man and defend him with fire and sword. These fans are not just devo devoted, they are busy, serving as de facto free PR refs, co-marketers, and brand evangelists for SpaceX, uh, Tesla, and Musk's other so-called cult brand uh, products. This now also involves his promotion of Dogecoin. In their free digital marketing, Musk's devotees drive home and defend Musk's apocalyptic prophecies while lending his utopia, utopic vision of a new Earth on Mars an aura of factuality. An important mechanism to transmediating the Musk popular mystique, or what has been called the Musktique, is that fans have enlisted themselves as co-architects of Musk's transmediated cult of personality, widening and deepening its impact on the public imagination. Fans fly into action when holes one could fly a rocket through, for instance, appear in Musk's edicts such as, we must leave the Earth as soon as possible in order to avoid extinction as a species, or his promises to put one million people on Mars by 2050, or his rebranding of Mars to the American public as Earth 2.0, and the survival backup drive for life on the planet. Musk's fan armies spring into action with troll comments, dueling and eviscerating Musk critics as they creatively produce a whole host of venerating videos, uh, venerating blogs, digital tributes, superhero shrines, and hagiographic Musk memes. Here I focus on three main archetypal devotional visual representations of Musk that proliferate across the media sphere. The first is the image of Saint Elon, the holy prophet. The second is a whole genre of uh, means and images uh, of Musk, M Messiah Musk, Rocket Jesus. The third is Musk as real life Iron Man slash Marvel superhero, Tony Stark. Together, this triptych of images packs a powerful rhetorical punch, persuading publics to buy into or at least to be complacent about these salvific New Earth escape fantasies about Mars that foster a kind of fatalism about our capabilities of repairing, renewing, and revitalizing, regenerating our own planet. So spoiler alert here, my aim is to disrupt and to intervene in these fatalistic obsolete Earth slash Mars as New Earth narratives and into the hagiographic visual rhetoric surrounding Marks surrounding Marx, surrounding Musk that, that, that furthers um, these images. So I want to sort of be demystifying, or we might call it demuskifying them. So why and what's at stake? I think um, we trust Musk to drive us home to Mars at our own peril. And rather than a salvific escape, the, relent the relentless march towards colonizing Mars takes us, as Dykeman would say, the wrong way home. Musk's legion of de devotees either self-describe or ascribed a variety of monikers. This is like how many names a culture has for the word snow. T tells a lot, a lot about it, the fact that there are so many names for Musk fans. Musketeers, muskrats, muskovites, musk bros, Musk's Twitter army, the Twitter cavalry, musk diehards, musk trolls, the Teslarati, uh, Elon rangers, and of course the musk meme militia. 
On Twitter alone, Musk has over 100 million followers. The most popular on the Elon Musk theme subreddits has over a million followers. A host of Elon Musk themed Tumblr fan fiction, sexy photos of Musk, erotica, fan photos, fan art, erecting a series of digital shrines to the tech entrepreneur. Do a cursory search on the crafty e-commerce site e uh, e Etsy.com and Elon, Ma Elon Musk fan, fan art brings up nearly 400 vendors. Type Elon Musk fan videos into YouTube and you will be inundated and impressed by the profile, by the, uh, the prolific DIY media making productions of his fan army. This is one, uh, one uh, video alone that has over 32 million views. It's called Elon Musk, I Don't Get Up, uh, I Don't Give Up, and it's set to um, uh, Coolio's Gangsta's Paradise. Um, in the comments, viewers report goosebumps, chills, and even tears in watching as they gush, quote, this man is a hero, a gift to humans, unquote, genius, quote, a living legend, unquote, quote, I am grateful to live in Elon Musk's presence, unquote, quote, God bless Elon and keep it up, we stand behind you, unquote. Videos on the subject of how or why Elon Musk is the real life Iron Man uh, from Marvel Comics are popular enough to constitute their own streaming genre. And of course, there's the more formal documentary from 2018, Elon Musk, the real life human, uh, which reinforces these um, Idealiz idealizations and devotions. So the meme verse is one of the fertile most fertile grounds for this kind of creative uh, labor. As uh, Ryan Milner points out, uh, though memes are frequently dismissed as silly or superficial, the social significance of mimetic media is worth our analytical attention as memes signify important shifts in mediated public conversation. Milner contends, quote, whether an individual meme lasts a night or a week or a year, whether it's shared on one thread, one site, one hashtag, or spir spirals out to millions of users in thousands of contexts, this media form has much to tell us about how public participants mimetically make their social worlds. I would additionally argue here that memes like those that Musk's digital fan army produce deserve our greater analytical attention as they are increasingly easy and cheap ways to market spiritual and religious uh, sensibilities and commitments to a wider audience and importantly to brand or in this case to rebrand these within particular ideological frameworks. So shout out to Victoria and Amanda and Theodore, this space you're working in in terms of TikTok social media like we're not slumming it as scholars to be working in that space. This is where the conversation is happening. We need to be there. Bravo, guys. Anyway, um, so what I'm skipping here in detail, uh, I do deal with in the RMDC journal, which is just why it is a wildly horrible, disastrous project to do human colonization of Mars. So I'm not going to go into that here, but I want to make a disclaimer that I'm not against um, doing science on Mars and sending rovers and, uh, you know, like cybernetic forms of, of human life, like um, as our emissaries to gather data on Mars. I am not against um, space science or uh, gathering data from Mars. Okay, so I just want to, okay, make sure I have a little bit more time here. Um, so I just wanted to touch on this just to show just how much thought and labor, free labor, is going into this type of thing. So this is an image created by uh, a Minsk-born artist, uh, Svetyek Petushkova, uh, designed wholly profit Elon Musk to celebrate the successful 2018 launch of SpaceX's Heavy Falcon rocket. In her YouTube video, the artist shows how she created the image by digitally modifying a traditional Byzantine icon of St. Nicholas the Wonder Worker and then layering the likeness of Elon Musk, the technological wonder worker, on top of St. Nick. Transforming St. Nicholas's white stole worn over his shoulders to symbolize the lost sheep carried by the Good Shepherd, the artist redesigns the stole for Musk adorned with stars and lightning bolts. Um, a nod to both SpaceX 
and Musk's manufacturing of electric vehicles. There's so much more going on in this image. Too bad I don't have time to go into it. Read the book. Um, but a lot of time and effort is going into this kind of labor. Musketeers, um, but musketeers' fervor for their saint and prophet has made a number of commentators draw attention to the fandom's dark side. In 2018, writer Michelle Spies set up a bracket-based March Madness type of poll on Twitter as a tournament for worst dedicated fan base. This included everything from Harry Potter and Whovians to Trekkies and Disney fans. More than 20,000 people voted. Elon Musk won hands down as having the worst fans. Obviously, this was not a scientific poll, but um, the commentary afterwards was revealing. Spies qu quips, Elon Musk is their masculine technological messiah sent to bring them into a new era. They will defend their billionaire lord to the death. Okay, so I just wanted to touch on this slide since I'm running out of time here. In 2018, Forbes, a Forbes article, Science Reveals the Face of God and It Looks Like Elon Musk, reported a study conducted by psychologists at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. They interviewed uh, 511 Christians. They showed them various profiles, various facial characteristics, and came up with a composite of what God would look like. And apparently God to these 511 Christians looks like the richest man or the second richest man, depending on what, time, what day it is. Man in the world, Elon Musk. Um, so yes, so this is also, um, it's hard to tell, are, are they imbibing images of Elon Musk and this looks like power and an ultimate power to them? It, it, it's hard to tell, but there's a whole slew of um, memes about um, Elon Musk being um, the Messiah, the Messiah come to, to and, and this is a funny meme, but I, in the chapter I go into the very serious theory of fans that he has time traveled back from Mars um, to uh, save humans and bring us there. Okay, so um, I had another whole section on um, Elon Musk as the real Iron Man. Of course, he made a, ca a cameo appearance where we have fictional Iron Man with like real life Iron Man meeting in a very meta space in, um, in Iron Man, uh, the 2010. But so um, concluding thoughts here, where are we headed? When I mentioned to a colleague my sense of being taken in Dykeman's sense the wrong way home in, a man, in the manic rush to leave Earth and colonize Mars, she quipped that contrary to Dykeman's image of the trusted father uh, figure, and now Musk is the father of nine children, driving the vehicle home. In the case of Musk, no driver is even required. After all, she reminded me, isn't Musk the one pushing driverless cars? No need for a driver, just install the right software and the A AI systems will do the rest. Less reassuring is this image of um, the Tesla Roadster, Roadster with Starman that was supposed to, that was launched into space. It was supposed to go to Mars. It went off course. Now we're like not exactly sure. We're sort of tracking it. Who knows where it's going? Starman's kind of lost. Um, <laughs> we don't know if he's going to crash back into Earth. But my point is here to sum up, even if Starman is lost, Earth is not. And that is an important message to circulate widely and repeatedly in the media sphere, and that's one of the things we need to be doing. Earth is not a lost cause. Doom is not in inevitable. Earth is not last year's model that we should scrap for Mars as the new improved planet 2.0. Earth is not the car crashed hard drive that we should toss out with the rest of the e-waste because it is no longer economically sensible to fix. Instead of colonizing Mars, what if we launched a new global, global trend? Staying, it's the new going. Thank you. I gotta stay out of the, stay out of the way of the technology. Okay, next, uh, Catherine Newell, whose paper is titled After Us, Contrasting Scientific and Religious Visions of an Earth 
without, I'll speak slowly, Earth without it's okay, I people. It. Okay. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Good morning. I'm going to try to go easy on the sibilance here. So uh, I did change some of this, but I do want to circle back to some of what Sarah and others have talked about. Because when Sarah and Eric first asked me to contribute to religion in outer space, my first thought was of the word missions. It'll make sense in a second, I promise. My chapter for the book deals with the double entendre of the idea of missions at the heart of some of the lesser known work of the artist who's at the center of my book, Destined for the Stars. So we're going to talk more about Chesley Bonestell in a moment. Uh, he is also responsible for the cover art of my book. Sarah said I needed to promote my book, so there it is. Uh, but as a quick side note, I'm going to be talking about Chesley Bonestell, considered the father of modern space art, as well as Werner von Braun. Uh, but for those of you who have not met Bonestell, if you don't know who he is, I promise you, you've seen either his work or work that's been reproduced millions of times by everyone uh, from NASA to science fiction artists to Hollywood, where he himself worked as a special effects artist for uh, several decades, and so if you put a pin in this still from The Martian, it will come back in a few slides. Uh, he actually has his own small cameo in the movie. His The painting we just saw is hanging in the background of the movie itself. So, so from 1943 on until his death in the 1980s, Bonestell was, again, the uh, kind of go-to person for visually stunning images of space, but in 1973, Bonestell accepted a commission to paint all 21 of the California missions as they would have appeared in the 19th century, which, although we all know the historical reality of the missions, they were in fact almost apocalyptic, shall we say, in their embrace of genocide and ecocide. His commission was predicated on representing a golden age. So the golden age of the missions depicts a pastoral in the farming sense, not the religious one, uh, space where heart and hand come together. The landscapes provide a domestic contrast to the theme of Bonestell's previous oeuvre. They're a mirror image of his space paintings, in a way. Essentially, the future predicted in his paintings of missions in space was predicated on some version of the ahistorical golden era of this religious history. The logic of the space mission is tied to the logic of the California missions, an ideal, a utopia, a circular history that I argue in my book and elsewhere has a way of coming back. So missions in California, by an atheist, by the way, uh, were quite a departure from paintings of missions to Mars. So at the time that Bonestell took this uh, commission, he actually was already a household name for his images of missions to the moon, uh, to Mars, and beyond. So see, these are some of his greatest hits. Uh, beginning in 1952, Bonestell was part of a series of articles in Collier's magazine depicting humanity's, really it was basically America's, uh, future in space. The magazine symposium later served as the source material for, well, let me do it really quick. Uh, the symposium featured artwork by Bonestell and a long editorial by Werner von Braun, who also was one of the main talking heads in its later adaptation as uh, a 1955 Disneyland episode, Man in Space, followed by Man in the Moon and Mars and Beyond. Uh, that were, at the time that Man in Space premiered, it was one of the most watched television episodes in television history, which granted was not that long at that point. Uh, and it's on Disney Plus, you should watch it. It's actually pretty entertaining. Uh, and in turn served as the inspiration for the theme parks Tomorrowland. The symposium and the following media depicted a future in space not unlike Bonestell's depictions of the California missions, the natural heritage of a people following their God-given destiny. But there were some who were not buying this depiction of a rosy future any more than uh, how today we don't buy the image of the mission's rosy past. So among those 
were uh, some who wrote in in 1959 to the Christian Century, which published a collection of 13 letters addressed to global leaders, including the Pope and others, uh, primarily written by male leaders in the American Protestant Christian Church, and feature a, a rhetorical style of pointed and poignant questions regarding the current state of the world, some of which might sound familiar to us today including one letter that was addressed to Werner von Braun, who, uh, former Nazi rocket scientist, no big deal, uh, who became the architect of the US space program, some of which is covered in the letter, but whose work was at the centerpiece of the Collier Symposium. The letter is written by Chicago Theological Seminary President Howard Schomer. In his letter, Schomer suggests, among other things, that the nascent National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA was only a couple years old at this point, and the US Army's plans for missions to the moon were a waste of terrestrial resources, an argument that sounds familiar to us today. But citing several grievances, Dr. Schomer also pointedly asks Von Braun if his hapless rockets are a new ark intended to airlift humanity from a terrestrial habitat irrevocably condemned to destruction. Going easy on him the first time. Dr. Schomer's vision of the end of time is a product of the most pressing ecological concerns of his own time. Uh, in his letter, he cites things like pollution, sorry, overpopulation, and everybody's favorite, the potential for uh, complete obliteration by ascendingly powerful hydrogen bombs. The apocalyptic potential of the atomic bomb was not lost on anyone. Uh, this is an illustration by Bonestell, I believe, for Life magazine just a couple years later. And it's worth noting that uh, Bonestell went to Columbia University, so when he accepted the uh, commission to do the big one hitting New York City, he of course had the bomb hit NYU. <laughs> uh, but the potential of the atomic, let alone hydrogen bomb, is not lost in anyone and led to ruminations, both religious and secular, that the beginning of the end was at hand. It was also uh, in keeping with an explicitly millennialist Christian concern that our planet is doomed to annihilation. Dr. Schomer's vision of a seemingly inevitable future where the apocalyptic visions of John of Patmos will not only come to pass, but be human made. And uh, this actually shows up in one of my favorite science fiction stories, and sorry to uh, ruin the end of a 60 something year old science fiction novel. Uh, but this is actually how the 1959 Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter Miller ends, that uh, a group of Christian clergy actually shepherd a group of survivors off the earth, uh, heading for other planets on rockets as the earth is finally succumbing to uh, becoming an atomic wasteland. And as the last monk leaves, he shakes the dust of earth from his sandals and says, this passes the world. Dr. Schomer probably didn't read this, it's fine. Okay, so perhaps unexpectedly, Von Braun, so after, who, after he moved to Texas, uh, the conditions of his surrender were to move to Texas and uh, in 1946 and build up the US's rocket arsenal. Uh, but he actually became a born again Christian, as one does when one moves to Texas in 1946. He replied to Dr. Schomer the next month and explained that, among other things, missions to explore space are not science fiction and that space travel is a safety valve for the very overpopulation and resource depletion the good theologian fears. But Von Braun turns the value of missions to the moon and Mars around from escaping a doomed Earth, acknowledging but moving past religio millennialist fears combined with potential uh, d disaster to an exercise in divine obligation. Says Von Braun in his response, when the inevitable end comes by the grace of God, we shall send man through space to the moon and other planets on the first leg of his last and greatest journey, the journey through space. And this is in keeping with Von Braun's own profile at the time because he was one of the greatest evangelists of space in history, uh, but also an advocate of a new millennialism that married space exploration and God's purpose for humanity. 
And he sort of saw this trajectory from uh, the V-2 rockets that he built for Hitler's army in, and their uh, morphing into the United States Saturn V that would ultimately carry American astronauts to the moon. He saw this as the fulfillment of humankind's sacred duty to leave Earth and colonize other planets. So he warned that the sun would explode, our divine souls would be lost unless we saved ourselves by using our God-given ability to create technology that would ferry us to other planets. If man, he replied to Dr. Schomer, is alpha and omega, then it is profoundly important for religious reasons that he travel to other worlds and other galaxies. For it may be man's destiny to assure immortality, not only of his race, but even of the life spark itself. So if this phrase, the life spark, uh, sounds familiar, it's because the notion of a life spark is at the heart of what is sometimes called panbiotic ethics or life-centered astroethics, where uh, Mountner and others describe it as expansion in space combined with life-centered ethics that can best secure a long-term survival as a species. Uh, this ethical system is both inspired by and deliberately decoupled from a single institutional religion, although Mountner references uh, Buddhist principles in this paper. The primary mor ob moral obligation of humanity is now the preservation and perpetuation of organic gene protein life due to the, quote, unique place of life in nature and the biological unity of all life. So according to Mountner, quote, belonging to life then implies a human purpose to safeguard and propagate life. Expansion in space will advance this purpose. So this idea of preserving the life spark, or however you'd phrase it, has become one of the articulated, I would say, excuses for our modern, modern corporate space race, in which we hear echoes of both von Braun's idea of a life spark, or light of consciousness, and actually some of Dr. Schomer's terrestrial criticism of the same. On the other side of this purported humanitarian wish to preserve life in what many, including Sarah's work and Mary Jane's, uh, have diagnosed is indeed using rockets as a new arc to escape the destruction of what humans are causing on the planet right now. Fires, droughts, floods, hunger, superstorms, and winter temperatures lower than the ambient atmosphere of Mars, which you all not are all not experiencing because we're here in Phoenix. Hooray. So what is at stake in these space saviors missions is the explicit sense of a planet doomed to annihilation. Whereas Dr. Schomer's end of the world scenario was profoundly anthropocentric and specious, it also prefigures the scientific description of an extinction event as a foreseeable outcome of the Anthropocene, relied on by people like Musk and Bezos to justify a flight from a habitat irrevocably condemned and a planet appointed to destruction. So here in the 2020s, the poles have shifted, but not much has changed. While the prediction that we will need to flee a dying planet continues to animate this new space industry, the, moting, the motivating explanation today for an anticipated extermination is not divine condemnation, just deserts for a fallen species, or even just the results of our own hedonism. Instead, the oft-repeated inspiration, especially for these privatized space companies for leaving the planet, is the varied and devastating outcomes of, again, the Anthropocene, space booster CEOs like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk champion preparedness by cre of uh, creating settlements on Moon and Mars, what some of their critics have called the search for a planet B, in expectation of Earth's uninhabitability in a generation or less. As a further justification for what on its surface is portrayed as a noble act, the ferrying of humanity away from a planet wasted by our own excesses, is the leveraging of an argument of a planet that could heal itself if only we would just leave. I think Sarah made reference to this a moment ago. Either by dying out or as Musk at all would have it by moving to Mars. It's a thought experiment popularized by the 2007 book, The World Without Us, among other places. but. Uh, science journalist Alan Weissman's idea of wondering what would happen to the planet if all humans disappeared, not by calamity or some grim eco scenario, but by a vanishing, a literal rapturing away. Turns out over the hours, weeks, years, and eventually centuries after our passing intellectual conjecture based on eco-biological sciences tell us that the earth would eventually be fine. 
So in lieu of Christian rapture, in which only some people have cho are chosen to enter eternal paradise, in this version, one adopted explicitly by especially Jeff Bezos in his future off-Earth plans, is the entire ecosphere that returns to its paradisical state. Like Bonestell's California emissions, it's a picture of heaven on Earth, if only people weren't around. So from uh, Dr. Schomer's 1959 letter to whatever recent crazy thing Elon Musk has said about Mars, Bonestell and Von Braun's description of missions to other planets and a future in space were meant to be a natural extension of the positive forces of humanity's desire to go forth at a time when the predominant fear in American culture was that the planet was doomed. Today, Musk and Bezos represent a new kind of millennialist fear that we are going to be wiped out by climate change, uh, possibly still bomb ourselves into oblivion. But their solution is not the fulfillment of a destiny or calling. It's a full-on mission to escape an Earth still, as Dr. Schumer put it, condemned to destruction. The narrative shared by the space boost boosters and space doomsters is that an extinction event on the scale of the dinosaurs has been foretold, and so our new mission is to extend life beyond Earth. But then as now, for some, for some, the route to fulfilling this mission is repenting and healing, while for others, it is rockets. So, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I want to correct a previous error and uh, read the rest of Ben's uh, corpus of material. He's a co-editor of Religion, Attire, and Adornment in North America from Columbia, Religion, Food, and Eating in North America, also from Columbia, the Bloomsbury Companion to New Religious Movements from Bloomsbury, um, and he is the co-general editor of Nova Religio, the Journal of Alternative and emergent religions. His paper today is titled To Infinity But Not Beyond Unicult's Transhumanist New Religion. Thank you. So I study, among other things, UFO religions, and my chapter for the book, which I hear is coming up this summer perhaps, um, looks at um, groups which I typically call UFO religions, and I, I refer to, I think, as outer space religions in, in the text, sort of playing with questions about um, uh, religious groups, primarily new religious movements, that uh, have central to their practices or ideology, worldviews, or beliefs, something having to do with the extraterrestrial. Uh, so I'm talking today about new research, uh, and it's, I'm still in the data gathering stage. This is very sort of uh, early research on a group I've just began studying called Unicult, uh, which actually my students uh, told me about, and then uh, actually some of Sarah's students told me about as well, and I was actually late to the party. Uh, my students knew more than I did, and a lot of, it, a lot of their material is on TikTok, and um, uh, YouTube. Um, I have not yet accessed their Discord server where a lot of their internal talk goes. I'm sort of um, working up to that. But um, anyway, so that's, that's the context here. What made you join a cult? The interviewer asked. I, I just kind of felt pulled towards spirits and aliens and all these things. And that's really what drew me towards Unicult, spiritually, explained Space Freckle on the left a member of Unicult who joined as a college senior. Her comprehensive interview, produced by Unicult and hosted on their official YouTube channel, covered topics ranging from Space Freckle's Catholic upbringing to her spiritual seeking, experimentations with magic and witchcraft, and spiritual engagement with art. Themes that emerge from the interview are a sense of meaning, fun, energy, and creativity. Space Freckle indicates that she found both her authentic self and a meaningful community within the group, friendship and spiritual companionship, as well as personal fulfillment. 
She also describes extraterrestrial spirit guides, spells, and rituals. And of course, both Space Freckle and her interviewer, as well as all their co-religionists, explicitly referred to the group as a cult, not perhaps what one expects. The new religious movement Unicult, founded in 2012 by Unicol Unicron, offers a blend of New Age spiritual teachings, abundance practices, intentional and ironic use of cult language, and an intensive engagement with media, the arts, and social media. The group gained popular attention in a series of short online documentaries and then a 2018 Indiegogo campaign by the group to construct a robotic brothel. During the pandemic, they again made the news after the founder made a number of statements critical of vaccines and the pharmaceutical industry. The group meets mostly online, being geographically dispersed, but comes together for weekly CAM churches, and members of the group interact mostly on Discord and other private and public social media. They gather for occasional in-person retreats, which I'll talk about, and plan to build an intentional community on property Unicol just last month purchased in Georgia. Depending on how one counts, between several hundred and several thousand people affiliate with Unicult, ranging from dedicated members to more passive participants. The group's visual and religious culture highlights rainbows, space aliens, dolphins, angels, and crystals. The extraterrestrial connection is not just for show. Founder Unicol Unicron claims to be a star seed that is an extraterrestrial embodied on Earth and presents their teachings as derived from outer space, Arcturian civilization. As a note, uh, Unicol identifies as both transhuman and transgender and uses the Zizim pronouns, which I will use here. Yet simultaneously, this cosmic new religion has a very this-worldly focus with an emphasis on human healing, material abundance, and self-transformation. Unicult is an outer space religion, sometimes also called UFO religions, though few such groups actually center on UFOs themselves. Outer space or UFO religions are often characterized as both millennial and otherworldly. Millennial, in terms of expecting imminent transitions, either catastrophic or progressive, to use Catherine Lessinger's model, when the extraterrestrials arrive. And otherworldly, since they associate salvation with saviors or destroyers from the stars. Following Norman Cohn and Yonina Talmon, Wessinger identifies millennialist movements as envisioning a collective, terrestrial, imminent, and total transformation. Yet despite the terrestrial nature of millennial visions, that is, they anticipate a transformed Earth, uh, not Mars, I should note, rather than focusing on a heavenly or post-mortem salvation, UFO religions typically look to salvation from the heavens. Their narratives, discourse, and practices generally all look to the stars. The best known UFO religions follow this pattern. Groups like the Raelians, Aetherius, Heaven's Gate, Kofuko no Kagaku, Happy Science. Each of these groups envisions or envisioned a sudden and abrupt transition, millennial transformations orchestrated from outer space. Hence the Raelian efforts to construct an embassy to welcome the extraterrestrials to Jerusalem to inaugurate a new society, or by contrast, Happy Science's efforts to warn the Japanese populace of extraterrestrial conspiracies, abductions, and infiltrations. Yet Unicult offers a very different perspective, as we shall see. Lest we forget, religious and spiritual engagement with outer space and the extraterrestrial is far broader than these organized UFO religions. Four in 10 Americans believe that at least some sightings of UFOs are extraterrestrial alien spacecraft, according to a 2021 Gallup poll. The number is even higher among non-Christians, especially those unaffiliated with formal religious bodies. Many of Unicult's teachings about self-transformation, energetic healing, and the use of techniques such as crystals, meditation, and past life regressions are also surprisingly common. According to a recent poll, approximately half of all Americans accept five or more tenets identified as part of the New Age worldview, including concepts like reincarnation, manifesting, astrology, telepathy, channeling, and related phenomena, all of which are central to Unicult. 14% of Americans engage in or accept the efficacy of crystal healing, 
a central practice of Unicult. And it is among these Americans, millions of people who take seriously the reality of extraterrestrial life and visitation, that new religious ideas like those associated with Unicult thrive. While millennial, Unicult's discourse focuses squarely on Earth, on the human condition, and on the realities of living as an embodied terrestrial being. I suggest that paying attention to Unicult may tell us more about the engagement of the extraterrestrial and contemporary alternative religiosity than focusing slowly on UFO religions with more otherworldly focuses. What is Unicult? Unicult's core message offers self-transformation and healing within the social context of global transformation. In keeping with what Susanna Crockford identifies as broader New Age norms, the movement focuses on practices that manipulate spiritual energies. This includes crystals, meditation, past life regression, energetic healing, manifestation, and magical or ritual practices. Their cosmology identifies a series of nested realities that include physical reality, social, spiritual, and ultimate reality. Practices in one reality affect other realities, hence one can manifest bodily healing or material abundance through spiritual work. Many of their specific claims draw from Hindu traditions as filtered through the American New Age, such as chakra healing. But this movement also utilizes broader esotericist language as well. For example, in describing the blue kyanite crystals that Unicult sells on its Etsy store, the description states, quote, blue kyanite is here for your throat chakra to help you speak the truth of your heart and to heal with your words. Great for lucid dreaming, astral projection, and clairvoyance, this stone is sure to bring some magical sparkle into your life. This is one of those stones that you can't describe. You just have to touch it, and the magic radiates out." Unquote. Extraterrestrialism and starseed rhetoric is both central and also peripheral within Unicultism. It is central in the sense that Unicol clearly presents themselves as a starseed and makes it clear that Z identify as an extraterrestrial being. Unicol Unicron's identity as a starseed is in fact central to their spiritual journey and the group's narrative of its founding. Quote, Unicol is an Arcturian Andromedan starseed, unquote, said Unicult. And the group is, quote, a space-focused welcoming community, unquote, appropriate for other starseeds, as they declare on their official website. Yet the movement and its leaders does not assume that all members identify also as starseeds and does not present this as a necessary condition for membership. Humans are welcome too. Sociologist and ethnographer Susanna Crockford, previously mentioned, argues that star seeds operate as an important component of contemporary New Age practice. Quote, in common terms, they are an alien or extraterrestrial, but one that inhabits a human body. Star seeds were planted to aid spiritual development of themselves and others as part of a wider effort to help the ascension of humans and the Earth as a whole to the fifth dimension." Unquote. Unicol explains it this way, quote, "...star seeds are alien consciousnesses born into human bodies." Unquote. As a result, Z notes, star seeds feel that they do not fit into human society. Unicol presents this as an opportunity for growth and transformations. Star seeds simultaneously quote, don't feel like Earth is one's true home, unquote, and experience a sense of difference from other Earthlings, but also experience non-physical realities, interdimensional contact, psychic abilities, empathetic abilities, and spiritual experiences looking at the night sky. This sort of self-understanding highlights the individual need to make sense of one's identity and transform a profound sense of alienation into one of meaning. That is, Starseeds come to know their perception of alienation as literally that, being an alien, a stranger in a strange land, but take this as an opportunity to develop spiritual gifts. Beyond the individual level, starseeds within the Unicult uh, understand themselves operating within a social context. Society simultaneously labels starseeds as abnormal, often mentally ill, as well as stands to benefit from starseeds' spiritual gifts. 
star seeds are, to quote Unicol, overflowing with ideas about how to make the world better. This discourse captures the heart of what makes Unicult's extraterrestrialism quite different from most other outer space religions. Rather than envision saviors from outer space arriving to transform society and usher in a new utopia, as one sees, for example, in the Unarius Academy of Sciences or the International Raelian Movement, and certainly distinct from the more apocalyptic movements envisioning extraterrestrial destruction, such as Heaven's Gate, Unicult understands the extraterrestrial transformation as quite terrestrial in nature. They also eschew a quietist mysticism that ignores social questions. Rather, Unicult claims that aliens are here, right now, among us. They are, in fact, us, for members of Unicult. Transformation comes from within the individual and will transform the whole society. Hence, Unicult calls for the creation of what they call Unitopia, a time, quote, which will come to pass as soon as we will it to, when all humans will be filled with light and love. All people will align their lives with the good of all, including our mother, Earth. We will be filled with respect and compassion for all living things, unquote. This is progressive millennial. This is progressive millennialism in the classic sense, to, uh, or as Catherine Wessinger describes it, quote, the millennial hope for a better collective future, which motivates believers to strive to improve themselves, help others, and build communities and nations, unquote. How then does a group that declares its founder and many members as aliens simultaneously seek to transform planet Earth? The answer, it turns out, is through the manipulation of the world through the mind, and the manipulation of the body through energetic healing. Here we see a two-directional relationship. Members of Unicult believe they can manipulate the world around them using their minds, what is called manifestation. But they also believe that physical objects, such as crystals, drugs, or the physical landscape, can affect the mind and the body. Rather than understand themselves as outside of the world, acting upon it, Unicult and their followers see their work as inherently worldly. Further, they simultaneously engage as, human, as, as fully human, as well as seek to transcend the human condition. They are neither humanist nor transhumanist, just as they are, just as they are both extraterrestrial and terrestrial. As I explore these themes, I want to briefly share some material I've collected on Unicult, focusing on one of their in-person gatherings. Yeah, I can get through it. In summer 2022, Unicult offered a 10th anniversary retreat in Estes Park, Colorado, on the eastern edge of the Rocky Mountain National Park, not far from where Unicol grew up and had their transformative spiritual experiences. The group advertised the retreat as an exploration of all the places in Colorado that, created, that impacted the creation of Unicult. Gathering in this specific physical space was therefore of primary importance, since it served as a manner of connecting with the formation of the group. Such gatherings clearly follow a pattern in spiritual and religious movements, both old and new. Yet Unicult goes further, noting not only the specialness of the place, as tied to Unicol and Unicult's history, but also the nature of the place itself as in fact just that, nature. Quote, Estes Park is a beautiful place. Most importantly, it's a place where we can be in nature." End quote. Uh, the group actually highlighted engagement with nature as one of the most important activities while on retreat. They described the retreat thusly, quote, "'We will go on hikes, meditate, do yoga, eat delicious food, stargaze, and take a few uni Unicult-specific sightseeing trips." Unquote. Far from merely a retracing of the group's history, a sort of Unicult Via Dolorosa, the group intended to spend the time, their time in nature, hiking, meditating, and stargazing. Not one, what one might expect from a group led by an extraterrestrial. The movement posted three videos to social media during the retreat, which I will briefly summarize here. The longest video, which is about 11 minutes of content, begins with Unicol showing the viewer the crystals she brought on the retreat, indicating how, uh, uh, how they're used, generally for healing and meditative purposes, 
and then shifts to Unicol's reflections on their past trauma and healing processes on the retreat, as well as a summary of what the group has been eating. While the topics seem completely disjointed, they are united by a concept of embodied spiritual experience. Crystals heal through bodily energy, adherents consumed cannabis so as to enjoy and relax in their bodies, and the group prepared and ate vegan whole foods as a way to nourish their bodies and spirit. To quote Unicol, everyone is in their own frequency connected to pure energy. Later, he indicated the group would take medicines and play by the river. This comment points to the place of the terrestrial world within the movement members' experiences. The embodied spiritual experience takes place in nature. This is amplified in a short video the group posted of a rather random series of joyful interjections as Unicol and their flock beheld a double rainbow arching between the mountains over the cabins. It's amazing! Wow, this is great! Whoa! Somewhere between laughter and tears, Unicol uttered words of pure amazement. This is our rainbow! We made this. We manifested it. Una bless. In the interest of time, I will skip over discussion of the final video they posted. I will nearly point out that it's Horse Tooth Reservoir. Uh, and in addition to commenting on their wonderful time swimming, they talked about the profound spiritual experiences they felt in and of nature. Uh, so what to make of this group? They are, as I said, small, but their practices, beliefs, and discourse are quite a bit broader. UFOs and extraterrestrialism are hot right now, and given various new government reports, popular culture, and new scientific and technological developments, that is unlikely to change. Unicult offers a specific vision of how one might be both terrestrial and extraterrestrial simultaneously. They root themselves and their experiences in nature, focus on bodily healing and transformation, and make extensive use of physical terrestrial objects like crystals. Yet they do so understanding themselves as in and on the earth, but not of it. Humans and not human, physical and not physical. Few people will likely declare themselves starseeds, like Unicol Unicron, but many are likely to look to the stars while keeping their feet on earth. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to slim things way down for my own presentation. I don't have a PowerPoint, so that will make it, I suppose, a little bit easier. Um, I'm looking around the room, and I'm feeling kind of old, but uh, maybe some of you have seen this in video or streaming. Uh, think about the scene toward the end of Mel Brooks's History of the World Part One, uh, which came out in 1981. In mock previews of the supposed follow-up film, which I hear is actually now being considered, um, Brooks presents a clip for a segment called Jews in Space, in which two men clearly presented as Orthodox Jews, black coats and hats, beards, uh, talis and prayer shawls, are zooming along protecting the Hebrew race. That's the song that's being sung. Uh, there is no one reason why this vignette is funny. It works on a lot of different levels, not least of which because it's Mel Brooks, and you're prepared to laugh, and it just is kind of silly. The starship is shaped like a Star of David. And... But I, I also wonder um, if it's because the image of Orthodox Jews flying through space is incongruous to our experiences or expectations. So I want you to hold that image in your head. Um, maybe you've heard Sarah and I just uh, co-edited a volume. <laughs> and um, I thought I was going to be getting a, a particular chapter from a particular contributor, and I, we turned out getting a very different chapter from that contributor. So this is, in a sense, uh, from that. This is the chapter, or not the chapter, it's not that great, but this is the model that I thought I was getting, and that is what happens when a religion goes into space, right? And there's an awful lot of work that's done on what's called exotheology, you know, how might Christians or Muslims or Buddhists deal with meeting extraterrestrial intelligence from somewhere else? What does it do to their own theology? But there's very little work that I found, and if you're familiar, please let me know, but there's very little work that I found that actually deals with the mechanics 
of religious practice as it moves on. And I think this reveals a certain Christian privileging of belief and faith rather than practice. Um, and so uh, as a thought experiment, really, I just, I pondered, well, what does it mean if Judaism, particularly the, the paradigm of Judaism that's been the model for 2,000 years, rabbinic Judaism, were to leave the planet? What challenges would it present? And I've come to the uh, conclusion that it might actually be a moment as profound in the development of Judaism as the destruction of the second temple by the Romans in the first century of the common era. Now, I don't think this is something that's just unique to Judaism. I think it may have application elsewhere. It's, in, it's interesting to me, there was a, a, a series of studies done 2015 and 2020 uh, interviewing people who identify with different religious traditions, evangelicals, Jews, Christians, I believe they're all Americans, but of different uh, faith traditions, and their attitudes towards space exploration. And um, the, the group that registered with the greatest problem in the notion of space exploration were American evangelicals. Uh, what's interesting about the 2020 follow-up survey is that when it was explained to them by people like Vice President Pence that it was about defense and not about science, then it became okay, right? So Space Force, good. Going to Mars, not so much. One of the, uh, not the only, but one of the religious traditions that seemed to have the least problem with the notion of space exploration was American Jews. Now, a lot of that might be because most American Jews, though, still within the paradigm of rabbinic Judaism, are a product of the Enlightenment, a product of a uh, modern period, in the same way that rabbinic Judaism actually has its roots at least 200 years before the destruction of the Second Temple. I believe that the, the paradigm that might shift if Judaism moves to another planet has its roots really in the um, introduction and maybe uh, tolerance, might be a better word for it, of permitting Jews to participate in larger society, but that requiring a certain compromise to not be too Jewy, if you'll ex pardon the expression, right? So the reform movement was created to sort of be a, 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 a firewall to keep Jews from leaving entirely. But between reform, conservative, and orthodox, there, these are all responses to the modern dilemma of how do you be Jewish in a world of non-Jews. What's interesting is that even though there are strong elements of rabbinic Judaism in most American Jews, whether they realize it or acknowledge it or not, rabbinic Judaism would have more trouble actually relocating off the planet, I think. Judaism historically doesn't have, or at least rabbinic Judaism historically doesn't have a missionary impulse. And historically, rabbinic Judaism has been a response uh, philosophically, uh, liturgically, theologically, uh, culturally, to radical powerlessness. And so Jews for the last 2,000 years have lived um, by the um, pleasure of a host nation um, until the establishment of the modern state of Israel. And so the notion of exploration, which presumes political support and power, Right? I mean, somebody's got to pay for the ships, whether it's Musk or the Spanish king and queen with Columbus. Those were not things that were readily available to Jews for the last 2,000 years. And so exploration is not really built in. What that means for me is that it's not just some of the things that are important in the behavior of uh, Jewish practice what we might call the mitzvot, the commandments, and the larger system of halakha, which a lot of people translate as Jewish law. I think that's really unfortunate um, because it feeds into a non-Jewish narrative that Judaism is all about the rules and is rule-bound and legalistic. Um, I prefer the term halakha literally comes from the root to walk or to go. So I prefer referring to it as the Jewish way of rabbinic Judaism. 
the relocation of those or the, the attempt to practice those off planet encounters some difficulties because of some things that are connected to being on this planet. In the same way, the temple Judaism that preceded it were predicated, was predicated on certain things related to the temple in Jerusalem. Once the temple is destroyed the second time and the priesthood is destroyed with it in the first century, it doesn't make sense to go on pilgrimage to a temple that's no longer there, right? Um, and so the, the role of Jerusalem as the center of the universe shifts and becomes more metaphoric, particularly until the establishment of the modern state of Israel. Rabbinic Judaism carries with it some of those elements of a focus on Jerusalem, but also um, is uh, prepared to live elsewhere in the world as long as there's still a connection to Jerusalem. For example, prayer toward Jerusalem, the use of uh, soil from Israel in uh, caskets when you bury the dead, a variety of things like that. Um, so let's, let's, let's take a look. This is all in the interest of time. <laughs> okay, the question is not whether there have been Jews in space. There have been Jews in space. It's interesting that um, when Mel Brooks produced his Jews in space, he probably didn't know but there had been one Jew in space to that point, a cosmonaut uh, who went up in 1969, but it wasn't, go figure, uh, widely broadcast by the Soviet Union. The first uh, Jew in space, Judith Resnick, 1984, um, was actually recruited in the same class as Sally Ride um, because she was a woman, not because she was a Jew. The Jew was just, you know, a, a plus one, I suppose. Um, but since then, there have been about two dozen Jews who've gone up in space. And there's, there's an indication that that might be the critical mass because the last two Jews to go into space that I've identified, I could only find out that they were actually Jewish by seeing that they'd made a contribution to a synagogue, right? It wasn't broadcast. It's become sort of like Catholics in space. Can you name any Catholics in space? Of course not. I mean, maybe the first couple, but there have been so many that it's like passe. So I think Jews in space have reached that critical mass. Now, they've also done, they've taken a lot of Jewish stuff, Judaica, into space, um, whether it was to um, sanctify the trip itself or that the trip would in some way add to the sanctification of the object. One astronaut took elements of his son's prayer shawls, the atarot, which is the sort of collar uh, up into space. One presumes that when he brought them back, they were sewn back on to his son's prayer shawls, but now they've been to the moon. Um, there are various uh, mezuzahs, the object that's put on a the door frame with certain prayers inside. Um, some were taken to the International Space Station and affixed with Velcro to the side of the sleeping quarters, which is actually totally unnecessary according to Jewish law, but it's a nice thing, what the heck. Um, when they came back, some of them went to museums, but some of them went to synagogues, and some of them went back into the home of the astronaut himself. So, you know, these objects have gone into space for uh, personal value. Some of them were actually taken by non-Jews, um, mostly because they were taken in honor of Israeli astronaut Ilan Ramon, who uh, died when the Columbia blew up, uh, disintegrated on reentry. And some of his friends who were not Jewish took up some things uh, at the request of his widowed uh, wife um, and, and things like that. Okay, so there's been Jews, there's been Jewish stuff. There's also been some Jewish uh, practice in space. Um, uh, Judith Resnick and a couple of others have actually asked rabbis when it would be okay to light uh, the candles for Shabbat. Now, given the <laughs> nature of the inside of a rocket, you can't really light up candles, but if you can, they can be electric. There's no requirement that they actually be a, a, a combustible flame. Um, and also, given the circumstances, I think most rabbis would say it's better to use electricity than blow up the rocket. Um, others have. Um, uh, put on the, the phylacteries, the, the tefillin um, at various times. There are challenges that are presented, and this is our first clue of what I call geo-orientation. When is sunrise? When is sunset? When it's every 90 minutes when you're going around the earth? There's, a, there's an old joke 
uh, about the first Jewish astronaut, presumably a man, because this is told before Resnick went up. He comes back to Earth, and they ask him, well, you know, how was it? He said, exhausting. And they said, why? And making a motion of the wrapping of the tefillin around his arm, he goes, shachrit min chamariv, shachrit min chamariv, right? The three sets of daily prayers every 90 minutes, right? So you sort of have to figure out, well, when is the seventh to observe Shabbat? And one rabbi, right, rabbinic Judaism depends on uh, rabbinic authority, it's not centralized. So if you ask a rabbi, you sort of have to follow that rabbi's uh, position. Uh, said, you got to do it every seventh 90 minutes. Another said, that's silly. You, you lift off from Florida, use East Coast time, right? So that's for, right. So they're different. This is what's wonderful about rabbinic Judaism. It's very flexible, right? Um, and so some have taken kosher food. None of them have kept kosher in space. I want to make that clear. They've had kosher meals. But usually those kosher meals are a few of the entire menu they've had in space. So they're not really keeping kosher. They've just had kosher meals. Right? I think any of these Jewish ritual behaviors in space would be um, considered praiseworthy because you know it's something. Um, but they're not really the performance of rabbinic Judaism in the more traditional level. In the interest of time, let me just cut to the chase. Because you cannot do certain things in space, in the same way that there are certain things you cannot do on Earth, for example, that sunrise sunset problem, what if you live in Norway, right, or Finland, where you might only get a sunset, you know, after a couple of months, right? The rabbis have calculated, well, how do you figure that out, right? But the problem is, the more of these problems that accrue, the more the rabbinic Jew will be living in the exceptions rather than in the rules themselves. And at a certain point, the Jew in space will decide that it's just as meaningless to try and obey the rule itself than it was for the post-Temple Judaism, uh, post-Temple Jews, to actually make the pilgrimage back to Jerusalem where there no longer was a temple. Right? So at a certain point, rabbinic Judaism, because of its connections to earth, whether it's kashrut, the, the necessity for flowing water in a ritual bath, the mikvah, the, the need for dirt, you know, burying needs to be done in soil. Judith Resnick, um, this is horrific, but the, most of the astronauts survived the actual explosion of the Challenger and died on impact when the cabin hit the ocean. And so they were able to recover most of the bodies. They weren't whole, as you can imagine, falling from the sky, but they were there. Resnick's family had her remains cremated, which is a possibility in space. Even if you, you know, let's say somebody dies in space, you can put them in the resupply ship back to Earth, which will burn up on reentry. But you can imagine since the Holocaust, cremation is kind of an icky thing for Jews, but there are actually halachic um, prohibitions that you're actually supposed to disregard a person's will if they request to be cremated and bury them instead, right? Because of the, you know, from the dust to the dust kind of thing, image of God. So how do you do that in another planet, right? So there are all of these uh, um, precepts, concepts in Judaism they're not theological, right? They're based in practice. But because of the 2,000 year history, it's not just the problems with practice and the threat of always living in the exception rather than in the rule. There's the attitude of rabbinic Judaism, which dating before the destruction of the second temple, going back to the destruction of the first temple is based on a notion called galut, right? Exile. It wasn't just the Babylonian exile, the physical exile, it was a theological exile, a distance, a spiritual exile from God. And so if you've ever seen, I don't know, let's say Fiddler on the Roof, right? And they're all sort of living in this horrible life in a shtetl in the Pale of Settlement in what is today Ukraine. And they're just waiting one day, you know, one day the Messiah will come and will suffer, will live horribly, oppressed and poor. And one day the Messiah will come. There is in this sense of Judaism, partly because it's 
um, imposed from without, but also because it's felt with it from within, of just sitting and waiting. So some of the rabbis in the post Mel Brooks History of the World Part One period, you know, since the 1980s, have said, "Why, why go out into space? You know, there's nothing out there. We're waiting for God here." So why go into space? You want to go? One rab rabbi actually said, any Jew that's interested in going into space is not interested in halakha. Right? So there's an attitude that ties rabbinic Judaism to the earth as well as a practice. And so the question is, what's going to happen if that becomes a reality? There's a wonderful story. I'm going to wrap up now. It's a wonderful little right, moderator's privilege. Um, there's a wonderful story written in 1974 by a, a Jewish um, science fiction satirist, uh, William Tenn, who uh, wrote, On Venus, Have We Got a Rabbi? And it's a story about um, this wonderful rabbi who is asked to adjudicate a dilemma at a interstellar conference of neo-Zionists on Venus. And a dilemma arises because some of the delegates are not humanoid, they're blobs. They're called bulbas. And they come and they want to be credentialed for this conference as Jews. And they don't look like humans. They, they're not even humanoid, right? And so they ask the rabbi, what should we do? And so after a period supposedly of study, but we know he's just like disappearing to make it look like he's going to study, he comes back and he says, look, there are Jews, and there are Jews. And the bulbas fit into the second group. It seems to me that should Judaism move out into space, rabbinic Judaism will pr likely survive on Earth. But the Jews that move away, there are Jews and there are Jews, and they're going to be in the second group. So that's my little thought exercise. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm putting on my moderator's hat, my moderator's kippah, um, and uh, we're going to take some questions. If there are any questions, I think there are microphones uh, back there. Does anybody have any questions for the panelists? Over here? There? Let's go here first. Thank you. Is there an on button on the side? Mm, there you that, go. Ah, there we go. Sorry, that was loud. <clears throat> My question is pre predominantly for Sarah. Um, have you done any research into uh, perceptions of Musk post the Twitter purchase, um, either of him or his followers since then? Um, so for non-fuss, for let's say, people who are musk skeptical um the the musk skepticals uh feel their skepticism skepticism has been reinforced as far as i can tell for musk diehards there is nothing that can dislodge the musk diehards in fact i was telling the rest of my panel at dinner uh and for whatever reason there's just a cadre of um white European, Eastern European men that since I published this article in December, in, and it's not, you know, it's the journal for uh, religion, media, and digital culture, but they all have um, alerts, like Google alerts for anything published on Musk. And so I have this guy from Serbia who writes me like every other day to try and convince me why <laughs> Musk really is the Messiah. And I, and I brought up some of the, the Twitter stuff and he, was like, and he was like, well, this is just indicative of, you know, his power is going to be, you know, he, he has to do this to accomplish, you know, this ultimate mission that he's on and the Twitter stuff doesn't look doesn't look um, pretty, but there's a plan to it. So as far as I can tell, if you were not a Musk fan, you're even more not a Musk fan after the Twitter thing, but th those, the hardcore Elon Rangers 
have not been moved. It, it, like the, the shine from Musk has not been dulled by the Twitter shenanigans. It's not remotely surprising. I mean, that's the Leon Fessinger model of cognitive dissonance. I mean, that it, you, you don't, if you're a hardcore believer, you don't lose it when all the data points the other way. I and mean, that's, which was a UFO religion, by the way. That, that's what he was studying. In fact, in, in some of the, the rhetoric, it seems like it almost makes their belief more authentic that he's being challenged in this way. There's a, a gentleman right here. I just have a quick curiosity about the unicult phenomenon. Um, I'm curious about the rainbow fixation and, and the unicorn obviously is a it's using the una from unicorn and um this in the emblem there's a narwhal tusk essentially and so on this terrestrial extraterrestrial sort of tension like these to me seem so earthly like the narwhal and its feature in like inuit culture and how it migrated into europe and i don't know it's just a curiosity if you would say, care to say any more about that well, that's what I think I find so fascinating. I should be clear, I've not watched all their, their TikTok, YouTube materials. And a lot of it's video, and I'm, I'm such a dinosaur, I prefer to just read. So I'm slowly running through it. But um, that's the tension. They're both extraterrestrial in focus, but highly terrestrial. What they're, what they're engaging is in, with is nature. And the rainbow is, is beautiful. And I think it just comes down partially to that. I mean, also, there's a fair number of sort of... Um, GLBTQ plus folks within the group, so the rainbow has sort of symbolic meaning as well. But um, I think more than that, it's 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 a symbol of beauty, and there's an aesthetic which uh, which they're attracted to, which they find personally meaningful. Uh, I didn't mention this, but most of the actually I've mentioned it in, in passing. Most of the members engage in artwork. Uh, Unicol sells art. Uh, Ghost to use one of their their members. Um, uh, the member has, has artwork. Um, a lot of them have sort of Etsy stores where they're selling their, their artwork. They're almost all in the tech industry for their day jobs within their, you know, they're doing sort of content creating for fun. But I think it, it's a good question. I'm not sure I, I know quite the answer besides that the aesthetic itself is, is part of the attraction, I think. Uh, and then I think, I mean, the subcultural sort of identification. Good I, question. I'm, I'm going to jot down ideas here. here. And I'll get Hi, uh, I guess this is for you, Sarah. Do you have a sense of uh, what role Twitter bots play in sort of the deification of Elon or bots in general? Because there seems to be a distinct presence on Twitter and perhaps other social media and maybe you know, engineers are engineering sort of this deification that it is not sort of human based in that sense. So. Right, yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely plays into it and amplifies the, the Musk militia more than, uh, but also bots are also monitoring um, any kind of, they're tracking for any kind of negative words and then they're immediately responding. So I do think his fandom is quite large, but even so that is amplified by bots automatically responding and being programmed to automatically respond to anything negative. Um, so, I mean, similar with Trump. Um, it, it, in, in fact, a lot of the dynamics are very similar between Trump, you know, Trump fans and Musk fans, for sure. It's a good point. I think I'll follow up on that. Um, being living in Syracuse, New York, the Erie Canal is there and Palmyra is close by and We've learned in, in the religious studies program there just around the intensity of what was happening at the Erie Canal, the difficulty of work, the, what was happening in people's minds, their experiences, gave rise you know, to this great second great awakening where all these new religious, mov new, mov new religious movements. Have any, any of y'all done temporal work uh, with like where we are now, like the whole world's at Erie Canal in the sense of just the technological innovation that is impacting the planet and then people Observationally, the uh, part of the reason that I have this kind of bifurcation between you know, the ideal of what technology would look like in the 1950s versus what we ultimately got uh, is the obviously the reality of trying to get um, 
three people just to the moon, sort of shook everybody out of, in 1969, shook everybody out of this fever dream that, oh, we're all going to be able to have a weekend home on the moon, and we're all going to be able to establish universities on Mars, that it was agonistic to get just three guys, actually two guys, to walk on the moon's surface. So. Uh, we see, Ben and I have been talking about science fiction, we see the way in which science fiction starts to, especially like Star Trek, starts out being super optimistic, and then after, in the 1970s, 1980s, it turns into, maybe this technology isn't uh, as coming to us as naturally as we thought. So what's interesting and part of what my work deals with in other ways is kind of the cyclic aspects of this kind of faith in technology and faith in science to save us and how much of it is, and I think one of the themes that we've been talking about, how much of that faith is itself a product of uh, or reflective of cultures that are kind of, as you said, invisible to uh, the way that we live unless we go and sort of look back at the history and like, oh yeah, this didn't come out of nowhere. And actually I draw from explicitly like all the way back to the Second Great Awakening and the way that the ideas about the meaning and the purpose of America, blah, 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 uh, and Manifest Destiny show up in art and that's the art that Chesley Bonestell is delivered. And I didn't use the images, but there are sort of like shot for shot images of Chesley Bonestell sort of replicating Hudson River School images of the American West. And I think we see that with technology again, that we sort of lose this perspective of, okay, well, we had a Saturn V, now we're gonna have the, what Musk for a long time called the big fucking rocket that's gonna take us to Mars. And uh, there's no sense on the technologist side of history, so that's why I think we need us to be like, by the way, we tried this, it didn't work. Let's, let's try again, let's be better. So I don't know if that answers your question. I wonder if I, if I might, um, you know, one of the things about that time period was the high level of unchurched, right? Um, leading into things like the uh, uh, development of the rise of Jacksonian democracy and greater participation, greater elevation of the individual that gives uh, the message of the Second Great Awakening, uh, the fuel, right? The personal uh, transformation and uh, um, conversion and things like that. And I think something similar is going on today if we look at the uh, rise in the level of unchurched, right? There are more nuns in O-N-E-S today than there are evangelicals in America, right? Um, and that's playing out in our politics, right? The, the decrease of party affiliation, the rise in independence. And I think one of the mistakes some people make is thinking that just because they're on church doesn't mean they don't have religion. They have a spiritual impulse. Now it's just being redirected, whether it's to elements of the Second Great Awakening or some of the movements that we've been talking about here. I think the millennial aspect's pretty central too. I mean, so it's Shopkeeper's Millennium is was it was the author for that. You know, what I'm talking about. Um, but it's impossible to separate the Second Great Awakening from like abolitionism, first wave feminism, uh, the, the intense sort of dystopic fears of, of a society falling apart that needs to be repaired, but those simultaneously also mean actual millennial groups like the Millerites who are expecting the actual end of the world. I mean, a lot of, a lot of that, I mean, to <laughs> I quote Battlestar Galactica, all this happened before, all this happens again. Um, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, it's a very apropos, yeah. Hmm? I like the reference. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, do we have time for one more? No, we don't have time for one more. So uh, yeah, everybody will be here. Back. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to our panel for doing a great job. I want to make two announcements very quickly before we dismiss. I just want to remind the JSRNC editorial board that we are meeting directly across in Tooker boardroom now. And directly after lunch, we have the Interplanetary Initiative panel in here as well. So please make your way back from lunch in a timely manner. Thank you. Oh, 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 I lean back.